Good day again. Grace and spiritual blessing and peace be yours from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. With this greeting of Paul to the church in Rome, I greet and welcome you to our regular Sunday worship broadcast brought to you from the Potchefstroom Methodist Church. My name is Lou Geiser, pastor and member of the ministry team, and it is indeed our privilege to be able to serve you with a word on this fifth Sunday of Easter. It is also our sincere prayer that you will be blessed, enriched and filled with the love, peace, joy and hope of our Lord as we minister His word to you this morning. Let us open in prayer. O oh, Father God, we thank you that you created us, that you know us and that you love us, that we are fully known and completely loved by you. And though we fail you, you have never turned your back on us. You remain faithful forever. And Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for your sacrificial and saving love. You lived the perfect life we could never live and died the death that we deserved in order for us to be forgiven and to live for eternity with you. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you convict us of our sin. Assure us then of your forgiveness and empower us for living lives pleasing to God. So try you and God as we are gathered here, we give you thanks and praise for your greatness. We praise your mighty works to the whole world and we praise you for your wonderful deeds. Your power is limitless, your wisdom is unparalleled and your grace is overwhelming and your love is never failing. You promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So guide us then to worship you in spirit and truth this morning through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as your disciples, we now lift up the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray as we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our hymn this morning is hymn 681, that beautiful hymn written by Henry Francis Light, who also is known for having written hymn 18, which is Praise the Lord, My Soul, the King of Heaven, and Abide with Me, hymn 948. And I read the words and we'll listen to the music afterwards. God of mercy, God of grace, show the brightness of thy face. Shine upon us, Saviour, shine. Fill thy church with light divine. And thy saving health extend unto earth's remotest end. Let the people praise thee, Lord. Be by all that live adored. Let the nations shout and sing glory to their Saviour King. At thy feet their tribute pay and thy holy will obey. Let the people praise thee, Lord, earth shall then her fruits afford. God to man his blessings give, man to God devoted live. All below and all above, one in joy and light and love. We listen to the music.
Amen. Our scripture readings this morning come from two very well-known portions out of the New Testament. And the first one is Romans 12, verse 1, which is headed, A Living Sacrifice, and also from verse 6 in Romans 12. And so Paul starts, and he says, Therefore, and we must know that whenever there's a therefore, something goes beforehand. And we find that at the end of chapter 11, and I read the verses 11, uh, verse 33 to 36, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out! And then it says, For from Him and through Him and for Him are all things. To Him be glory for ever. Amen. Then Paul continues in verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. He is good, pleasing and perfect will. And then verses 4 to 6. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ are we. Though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. And then we go to Acts 2 verse 42 to 47, which is headed, The Fellowship of the believers. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The wonderful description of the first church. Now I've entitled what I'd like to share with you this morning, Worshipping in Unity of True Fellowship. Now today is the fifth Sunday of Easter, as I've mentioned, and we continue celebrating the Easter event, and in particular the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're all familiar with the first commandment in Exodus 20, and Jesus' summary thereof in Matthew 22. And it effectively says that we shall love or worship no one or anything outside of God's sphere. And my aim today is to look at the nature of our worship, who we worship, and who we worship and why, and what Christian fellowship is, and how this leads through to our worship services. Now, if during this message I stir you up a little bit or make you mad, that's fine. We all need to be stretched a bit. Now, let's look at what worship is. Nelson's Bible Dictionary gives a very concise uh, definition of worship. And he says, The reverent devotion and allegiance pledged to God and how this reverence is expressed. And the New Testament worship is an expression of joy and thanksgiving because of the gracious redemption in Christ and focuses on the saving work of Jesus Christ. We all are worshipping creatures by nature and every day, everywhere we go, we worship. It is what we are and what we were made for. And in John 4 verse 23, Jesus said that the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. 
And then Robert Morris, a well-known theologian, also said that worship is our love expressed. But why do we need to worship God? And I think that the answer lies in that the focus of our worship must be on the greatness and infinite love of God and because of that. 1 John 4 verse 9 says that we love God because he loved us first and sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us. And we know the very well-known scripture verse is always quoted, John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And this brings the significance of both Christmas and Easter clearly into the picture. Someone had to come and restore the relationship between God and man that was broken in the Garden of Eden, and also to show us what holy living is all about. And there are many scriptures which address this love of God. And we need to view these passages from their foundational point, which is, Love is not an out-of-the-blue emotion. Love has its foundation in the very nature of God. And instead of seeing love as God's instruction on how to love Him and others, let us see it as God's unlimited expression of Himself. Therefore, when God loves, we can know that His love is infinite, like all of His other attributes. And this is an amazing thought. God does not just love us. He loves us infinitely. And when he forgives, he forgives completely. And when he saves, he saves thoroughly. And when he makes a covenant with his children, it is a forever covenant. The eternal infinite God does not express his attributes in a temporary or partial manner. No, no. He is an extreme God with an extreme love, and it is eternal. And it is good for us to be constantly reminded of this love. And the day we positively respond to God's call and accept His Son Jesus Christ into our lives by faith, then that love is poured into our hearts by His Holy Spirit as a free gift. And if this is not enough reason for us to bow down and worship our King as his children, then I do not know what is. But let us link this up with our scripture verses in Romans 12. The context of Romans 12.1, as I said, is the worshipful declaration of praise to God that Paul declares at the end of Romans 11. And I just repeat that again. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And based on all that God has done for us, Paul then urges us to answer God's urgent appeal, which is, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. Paul is begging us to live for Christ with our whole being, motivated by God's daily multitude of mercies. And that is even more reason for us to surrender everything we are and have. And Paul continues by saying that our life offering is to be holy and pleasing to God, which is our spiritual worship. We are urged to offer God our best, and when we give Him our best, it will be pleasing and acceptable to him. This then is our spiritual act of worship. And when we move on to our scripture verses in Acts 2.42, I just want to point out the word fellowship. Now what is true Christian fellowship? The Greek words translated fellowship in the New Testament essentially mean a partnership for the mutual benefit of those involved. Christian fellowship, then, is the mutually beneficial partnership and relationship between Christians who can't have any identical relationship with those outside of the faith. The mystery and the privilege of Christian fellowship is that it exists because God has enabled it by His grace. 
and those who believe the gospel are united in spirit through Christ to the Father. And that unity is the basis of our fellowship. And this relationship is well described by Jesus in his high priestly prayer for his followers in John 17 verse 23, where it says, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. And may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. We are united to one another by common beliefs, purposes and goals. And the importance of true Christian fellowship is that it enforces and reinforces these things in our mind and helps us to focus on Christ and his desires and goals for us. And then Hebrews 10 verse 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And then very importantly, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day of the Lord drawing near. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, Iron sharpens iron. And in true fellowship, Christians sharpen one another's faith and stir one another up to exercise that faith in love and good works, all to God's glory. Now, how does that get through to our Sunday worship services? Now, I know that COVID has brought an inhibiting factor into the Sunday worship services, but we need to rededicate ourselves to attend or to come and worship at the worship services. And the Bible tells us to partake in church assemblies so that we can worship together with other believers and be taught his word for our spiritual growth. And as seen in our Acts in Scripture, the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, Jesus' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And we should follow their example of devotion and be devoted to the same things also. Back then they had no designated church building, but every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Whether it be in a church building, whether it be in little groups, whether it be in Bible studies, that is important. And whether the meeting takes place and wherever that meeting takes place. Believers thrive on fellowship with other believers and the teaching of God's word. So worshipping or fellowshipping on a Sunday is not just a good suggestion. It is God's will for believers. And we need the encouragement and the upbuilding that church fellowship affords. In other words, being together with other believers of like thinking. The approaching end times should further prompt us to be even more devoted in fellowshipping and unity. Church is the place where believers can love one another, encourage one another, spur one another to love and good works, serve one another, instruct one another, honor one another, and be kind and compassionate to one another. And when a person commits to Jesus Christ for salvation, he and she is made, or is made a member of the body of Christ. And for a church body to function properly, all its body parts need to be present and working together in assembly. Romans 12 verse 4 to 6 continues to say and emphasizes that for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. A believer will never reach full spiritual maturity without having an outlet for his 
or her gifts. And we share that amongst one another in fellowship. And this, as I said, can only be attained in that unity of true fellowship. I close. Worship is more than coming to church on a Sunday morning. And while that is part of it, worship is actually the essence of what, what makes us truly human. We worship in fellowship out of thanksgiving for the goodness of God, for His grace, for His mercy, and His provision in all areas of our lives and at all times. And John Wesley said a very striking thing. And he said, Indeed, the extent to which we do not offer ourselves to God reflects the extent to which we do not understand the depth and the significance of God's mercy. And after worship service, the question should not be, did I like the music or the message or did the service please me today? No, the real question should be, was my worship both here in the service and as I now go out of this building into the world, was that pleasing to God? How our worship services go is extremely important, but God is just as concerned with how our service of worship continues outside of these walls. And to approach our short time here with an attitude of joy like the psalmist says in Psalm 122 verse 1, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And that is the attitude that I think we should all have. One person said, we don't come to church to worship. We come worshipping to the church. Meeting as believers is a personal time for us to present our whole being as sacrifices to God. Embracing what God does for us is the best thing we can do for Him. Then we discover anew the greatness of God and can recommit our lives to Him and worship Him in spirit and in truth in everything we do. Then to go out to display His love in our hearts by spreading it through our little worlds, we find our souls in operating every day. And that is when we will experience the indescribable joy and rejoicing in our Lord. Amen. I close with a very well-known song that we sing in our church. And I do it as a prayer of thanksgiving and commitment and also in remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross for us. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away, as wounds which mar the Chosen One bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there. Until it was accomplished, his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Amen. We close with a benediction. So in the week to come, wherever we may go, God is sending us there. And wherever we may be, God is placing us there. Christ who lives within us has something that He wants to do through each and every one of us. Believe it, go out 
And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the abundant presence, power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.